All right, welcome back from lunch. So um, we were having a conversation yesterday about platforms and the role that various platforms can play in, in helping GSNs embrace new kinds of capabilities, reach scale. Um, in addition to platforms, we've looked more specifically at a couple of categories of technology that we think could be very influential in global problem solving. We've uh, published a couple of reports on that. Um, I'm going to give you the quickly distilled view, and I'm, I'm happy to, to get um, some discussion going on some of these priorities and technologies that, that we've been talking about. Um, I think the first thing to say is that, you know, we, um, which is obvious probably to this crowd, but we are in an environment where technology continues to foster an enormous amount of innovation and disruption, and, and technology itself is evolving very, very quickly. Um, you know, we've gone past, you know, the web into social media and networks, and now we're looking at 3D printing and augmented reality and artificial intelligence and big data. Now, a lot of these concepts, I think, are, are still in their infancy when it comes to applying them to global problem solving. So what we've tried to do is, is pick up on solutions that are ready to, to use and deploy now. Most of those are in the mobile computing realm. And then to identify emerging opportunities in the Internet of Things in particular that we think could show a way forward for powerful applications that GSNs could embrace um, fairly cost effectively. And certainly with the support and partnership of technology companies in particular which can help deliver some of these solutions. So that is essentially what this presentation is about, is, is highlighting some of what is feasible today and what's being done and the impact of, of the adopting those technologies and some of what might be in the pipeline and, and, and capabilities that could be done in partnership with key players. Uh, so the reason that mobile is probably the most talked about technology for global problem solving is because that you know, that's where the adoption is, that's where the capability is, and, and we've seen huge improvements in that. And that's um, not surprising, I think, to this audience. We, we understand this story, but you can see some of the trend lines there in terms of the adoption in, in developing countries, you know, reaching in excess of 75%, 80%, 90% in countries like China, India, um, Brazil, and so forth. In the least developed countries, um, you still have relatively low penetration rates. So it's, it's not, this is not universal, but the rates have certainly increased significantly. The other thing that is promising is that, you know, as we're looking at, you know, forward into the future forecast, you know, these are the um, shipments of, of different tiers of smartphones. And you can see that the low cost smartphones are becoming much more widely available. So you can get a smartphone for less than $100. And in fact, Don, um, was was quickly referencing yesterday a company called DataWind, which has a fifty dollar uh, mobile tablet device now, which is I think probably the cheapest device on the market. And not only that, a really intriguing um, bandwidth solution, which enables you to get internet connectivity over a one and two G network. Which that's one of the other big constraints is the inavailability of of three G networks for internet and data connections. So. In terms of practical applications of mobile technology, there's, there's a bunch that I think are intriguing and, and, and worth reflecting on and things that we've begun to, to write about and identify case studies. So one of them, of course, is the, you know, the economic opportunity that mobile connectivity unleashes, the fact that you, know, you have, for the first time, thousands of Android developers in Senegal, Cameroon, Kenya, um, Ghana, and countries where you know, they simply they didn't have those kind of opportunities previously. And, and we were talking last night to, over drinks with Janet about impact sourcing and its problems in scaling, but still potentially, you know, delivering some opportunities. The question is, you know, can, will it reach the masses? But, but anyways, we, we see maybe a seed of an idea there. The question is whether they can get it up to a, a reasonably high scale to create mass employment. Um, another thing which is often talked about, and, and we've seen some promising applications here, is the delivery of public services, making government services accessible, accessible to people in developing countries. And, and this is um, particularly pertinent and relevant to communities 
or individuals who are in rural, remote communities who otherwise might have to travel um, for a day or perhaps even more just to get to a local government office to access public services, to get a license or, you know, to for any kind of, you know, variety of, of services. Uh, increasingly, governments and NGOs are, are looking at opportunities to deliver some of these things via mobile phones or um, to access important government information or even things like crop prices, you know, for instance, for farmers who want to look up prices on commodity exchanges and have more leverage or bargaining power when it comes to negotiating with middlemen um, to sell their crops. So we've heard um, of those kind of applications. Um, there's even uh, interesting applications in political engagement in mobile surveys. Um, really fascinating story of what happened recently in Uganda, and this was brought to us by one of our collaborators at the University of Berkeley, Sarah Bodiger, who wrote the paper on poverty alleviation and, and GSNs. And so she conveys the story of um, this big uh, crisis that they had in, in their banana plantations, a bacterial disease that was wiping out banana plantations at a rapid rate. And of course, Uganda, not only do they domestically consume uh, a huge number of bananas as a staple crop, um, it's also a major source of exports. So this was a, a national crisis. So they found um, 195,000 volunteers across the country, they sent out a mobile survey and they asked, do you know a farmer who is being affected by this disease? They wanted to get a sense of what the scale of it was and where the epicenters might be. So they sent out the message, they got 35,000 responses, which is um, out of 195,000, it's, you know, it's not a bad response rate. Uh, and through those 35,000 responses, they were able to fairly quickly get a sense of where, you know, this, this um, the bacterial disease, we, you know, which areas of the country it had most impacted, where they had it to um, effectively target their um, efforts. And, and not only that, they were able to send a message back and say, here are the three things that you can do to help eliminate this situation on the farm. So it became a, a vehicle to promote um, a strategy for, for solving the problem. Uh, health promotion is, has been an area where a lot of people have um, seen big opportunities in a variety of, of, of different applications of mobile technology. One of them, of course, is in health promotion. So for instance, um, one of the things that they've, they've tried to do, and sometimes it's delivering directly to the individuals, and sometimes it's using um, mobile devices that are, you know, that community health workers are using when they travel to rural or, or remote communities. Um, so they will give uh, pregnant mothers advice on maternal health, and they found that through those interventions, just providing simple ad advice and recommendations, they've been able to reduce um, mort <coughs> mortality rates by 30%, so a fairly you know, significant advance there. Um, you know, they have uh, also been able to do things like uh, if a community health worker goes out to a remote village, they can instantly send information back to um, diagnosticians or, or clinicians at a central hospital that again might take days and days to travel to physically, they can get a diagnosis and they can begin um, a course of action or recommend a treatment plan immediately rather than having to wait potentially weeks. In certain cases, uh, they've been able to do surveys of existing medical supplies and again, if, if a community is running short of, of certain vaccinations or medicines, that information can get back to health authorities in a matter of um, minutes as opposed to sometimes weeks as it would take to physically travel back. So there's a lot of important innovations in, in this space. Um, even in things like epidemiology, there's been a couple of interesting advances here in the Harvard School of Public Health recently did a very fascinating analysis which um, we were tracking. And, Essentially, you know, they in, in Kenya, they had identified the Lake Victoria region as an area where there was uh, rampant malaria, a uh, problem with malaria. And they analyzed anonymized cell phone records to get a sense of where people in the Lake Victoria region were traveling. So they get a sense of, you know, what the spread of malaria was like across the country, or, or at least how it was spreading, you know, through which populations and and their movements get a sense of, of the actual population dynamics there. Not only that, they were able to issue, again, kind of trying to supply useful information and in interventions. People who went into the Lake Victoria region would get SMS messages from the public health authorities saying, you're in an area that has high rates of malaria, you should consider using bed netting if you're sleeping. Um, 
So again, you know, interesting ways to apply a technology to help solve a problem. Um, and then, of course, there's probably one of the most talked about applications, which is mobile banking, which was pioneered initially in Kenya um, and uh, has, has increased dramatically the ability of, of uh, the unbanked to access financial services, uh, savings accounts, and, and in some cases, even credit um, for those who want to invest in businesses and entrepreneurship and so forth. And, and so it's gone from Kenya to other African countries and it's been quite popular in India as well. And I wanted to give a, a quick opportunity for Matul to say a couple of words because I know this is an issue yeah. that addresses financial inclusion in a big way and something you've been focusing on. So, I'd, I'd yeah, so the interesting thing, and thank you, for, the interesting thing about mobile money is that for the sort of concept of access and usage, right? So providing access to a perspective that people may not want to really use. Mm -hmm. So mobile money addresses the access to any sort of product that people can even use, easy to understand. And so that's. <coughs> What the photo is said about mobile money. I think Bcash is another really interesting example in Bangladesh. Do you want to Where, explain what that is, just for uh, the group? Yeah. Yeah. So Bcash is another example of M-Pesa, which is uh, it's essentially mobile money service. And so M-Pesa gets all the attention and yeah. sort of all, all the headlines. But Bcash, by the end of this year, will overtake M-Pesa. So Bcash will have in Bangladesh will have over 16 million registered. Um, and they'll have 90,000 mobile money agents around Bangladesh. So you can go in and these agents are effectively human ATMs. So you have a mobile money account, you go into a store where the agent is and you can either deposit or withdraw cash. And the interesting thing about Bcash, and I think MPS, I'm not sure, but some of these mobile money services are starting to pay interest. So the money that you keep in the sort of system is you're getting interest on it, right? So they're starting to act like banks a little bit, which is which is really interesting mm -hmm. to circumventing the traditional banking system. But I mean, looking at sort of mobile money as, as a solution again that act, addresses the app access and the usage problem of financial <coughs> services, but there are still some barriers that you know sort of from a GSN perspective are relevant. Um, one is interoperability. Yeah. So this M Pesa runs on on Vodafone, but um, you know doesn't always run on other networks. Uh huh. Um, and so they need to sort of learn how to cooperate which can scale up yeah uh, the other thing is, is regu regulation right so Kenya and Bangladesh where big cash is have very sort of enabling regulatory environments and believe it or not even in Bangladesh there's some enlightened government folks who from day one actually work with big cash and said okay we understand that this is an important service and so educate us and how can we get the right regulations to facilitate your service but in a lot of other countries um, for whether it's because of vested banking interests or whether it's because mobile money is seen as a potential avenue to terrorist financing you know, post 9-11. There's a lot of different motivations for this, but regulators are not always supportive of mobile money. So sort of educating regulators on this um, sort of big policy network or similar to GSN type activity is another kind of pain point that I think uh, the GSN could address. But you know, if you look at um, the universe of financially excluded people, people who don't have access to financial services are about 2.5 billion. But over 1.8 billion of those have phones. Right. So that's right, that's the kind of the way you want to you want to make your contribution. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. Interesting. And and in fact we so we've completed Fairly recently, actually, just before we made the connection with Matul, we, we did a paper on financial inclusion, and, and that was exactly our recommendation: was that this was a huge opportunity, but you needed a, a set of GSNs to address some of these foundational issues. You mentioned two of them: standards and, and policy and governance. And and probably the other one is we argued that there could be operational and delivery networks that would actually. Um, deliver educational services and financial literacy training because that was part of it too was was that it was one thing to provide the infrastructure it was another thing to, to build the financial literacy and capability to to use the money effectively um, and, and especially to think about savings and, and potentially investment and so forth so interesting points um, so here's the the buts right um, and these are all the things that kind of come up and people say well what about this and and what about these constraints and so forth? And, and again, these are big issues that I think GSNs can potentially address. So the, the number one was number one issue, and I alluded to this was 
you can see in, in smartphone growth that you know, there's a lot of the, and this is just in Asia, but the pen penetration in the, in the lesser developed countries is much, much lower. And you know, without smartphones, you're limited in the kind of richness of the interactivity and the kind of solutions that you can develop. Basically, you're, you're stuck for the most part with text-based SMS solutions, which we've already seen can be effective. Um, they can do certain things, but they're constraints. You know, so it's not the rich mobile applications that we're used to here. Um, so that's one issue, but one perhaps it is, is being partly addressed by the private sector and companies like DataWind. Um, the second is literacy rates in multiple languages. This has come up in a lot of our conversations, you know, because you can't just develop mobile applications in the English language because, of course, you're serving populations that speak many, many different languages. So this becomes another capacity kind of challenge. And so this, uh, I have met this fascinating fellow who's um, at the University of um, Chicago. And he developed something called Scientific Animations Without Borders. And their approach has been rather to, um, is to try to convey important agricultural practices and innovations through animations as opposed to scripted kind of videos um, or anything else that was kind of dependent on on languages. So they've worked really hard to build these kind of animations. And again, it implies a, a certain, you know, um, you obviously would need a phone that, that could actually run videos. Or alternatively, you could set up, you know, local um, community clinics and practices where people could get access to these kind of phones. But the principle was to make something that you could share universally regardless of language. But certainly, when you speak to people in the field, um, that's a major constraint and one that they're working to, to address. And then, and this speaks to the challenge that we just talked about, which is that when you looked at the unbanked op um, population, we're talking about people who have less education, less income, or more likely to be rural residents and so forth. So, so that's why, in essence, these networks become important, why these are solutions that can't be delivered in isolation or purely as technology solutions. They have to be kind of you know, full, um, fully integrated with you know, human support and, and other kinds of support systems that make them work in practice. So that, um, that's a quick summary of, of what we've come up with in the, in the mobile space. So see if um, people have other applications that you're aware of or would like to share. I mean, certainly that doesn't, that's not an exhaustive list. I mean, people use mobile phones to document human rights abuses and all kinds of other things um, that we've talked about. But anything else that people have come across that's interesting? Yeah, Victoria. So right. on the ground, you can either document whether the pump's working or not working, or yep. you can do surveys, not just for civic engagement, but to get feedback on services. And there's all kinds of um, applications for that. It can give us much more real time. It's not the rigor of kind of RCT measurement, but yep. it's a much more continuous communication. We did a case study, just to pick up on your example of, of monitoring. So we did a case study on an organization called Actvo, um, which is a, a, an organization out of the Netherlands, which had developed this thing called Actvo Flow, which was essentially a, a mobile-enabled um, monitoring system for water pumps, which then you could deploy and you could get real-time analysis of whether the you know, water pumps that had been installed in, in remote villages were actually working and functioning and, and whether they needed repair and so forth. So that's a great example of that. Simon. Yeah, I think the, the most interesting thing for us in the region really is uh, about driving transparency with market economics. Um, yeah. And especially around that pricing question and looking at market prices and giving real-time pricing information. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day who's working in the region in the kind of grey market for water provision. There's a massive issue in Indonesia that um, as well as bottled water, they have this kind of grey market for clean water that's provided in jugs, but they were looking at the total value chain. The differential in price for the end user is less than 10% between bottled water and grey market water, but it's targeted specifically at kind of an emerging and the trouble is the quality of the water is really, really poor. And the, there are so many middlemen, there are at least nine stages of value added value chain that occur, but no one really understands the, the, 
how widespread it is, how many can be different from one region to another. And those constant, constant they can't really act as an intermediate um, value chain. So from a social enterprise perspective, they can't identify where you're going to, to activate social enterprises to try and address the issue. And the same same true, I think the same thing done in Latin America with waste pickers, where you have to say it's a similar problem. You know, waste pickers can go out and sort through uh, garbage dumps. You can have eight, nine, ten layers of the value chain between them and the end user mm -hmm. getting access to it. The level of insight around the economics and the complexity of that value chain can be massively improved by using these mobile technologies. That there are some guys in MIT who are doing work on enabling waste pickers to get better views on how to set up cooperatives around the kind of the conglomeration of all the various different waste pickers. And it has massive benefits for the local community. So I think that's kind of the area that I'm really interested in, that kind of economic Neat, yeah. Phil, and then. Uh, one of the questions I'd like to is um, the use of new technology for education. Yeah. Uh, from the point of view of, of, of cell phone companies, the discovery of them, and uh, children will begin with the equipment without any teachers. And all I've given them is some sort of instruction. And it comes, and we need to go Interesting. Gunjan, you had a. Right. So what, what would um, what sort of applications would you point to in particular? I guess this, are you seeing this in the C forty context or outside of that? Um, in, in C forty context, so yeah. the context I'm seeing it, but let's say I work with a bunch of silicon transportation and you know, getting five cities on a phone call can sometimes be challenging, but yeah. they're able to very quickly exchange messages on WhatsApp, which is something people are becoming increasingly comfortable with and they're directing to the solution. Fascinating. Yeah. Janet, you had a suggestion. No, yeah, no, it's just really a comment um, that we find the education uh, part of it. Um, and what we're doing is we're evolving. So we are still offering certain things in the name gender. Excuse me. Um, and from the self directed learning, we're talking about this is the feedback we're getting. It's really how you um, support people in that whole change process and understanding. Right, right. Good stuff. Okay. Um, so, so we'll move on to part two, which is Internet of Everything. So this is when we, we go from the world of connected mobile devices and computers to connected everything, right? And so Cisco and other companies are, are working, um, you know, day and night on, on enabling this kind of reality, right? And, and in some cases, it, it's coming quicker than you imagine. So yes, farmer fields are connected to the internet and cars are connected to the internet and even cattle are connected increasingly to the internet so you can track them and keep track of them and even underpants can be connected to the internet. Um, Ew. <laughs> That's a carbon electrode fiber that um, will track your heart rate and glucose levels and other vitals um, developed by the U.S. military. But, but it's the idea of you know, not just underpants, but all kinds of connected clothing. And so virtually you know, every inanimate object at some point becomes connected to the web and can transmit interesting 
uh, or maybe not so interesting information about you know its status or, or give you real time updates that, that simply weren't possible before. So the kind of applications in terms of global problems and, and at least making a contribution to problem solving are probably almost limitless. I mean, there's just almost you know there's there's all kinds of things. So I've just pinpointed a, a couple that I think are interesting. A lot of people have talked about smart homes and, and smart buildings and the fact that you know now every appliance, every major piece of machinery, a mechanical system in a building or in a home, you know, can be smart and connected to the web, and you can autom you know they the systems themselves will automatically adapt to external conditions. So that they are actually programmed to maximize efficiency and use fewer resources. So that's um, in terms of resource conservation, that's an important uh, development for sure. And that includes everything from energy systems to water systems to the, the whole works, every, every mechanical system you can, you can possibly think of. Um, in traffic congestion, which is something that um, I know Simon has been working on and, and we'll discuss maybe a little bit in the panel um, after this, you've got a, a whole plethora of, of different innovations here. But in this particular example, you have um, smart road systems that automatically vary speed limits according to the existing traffic conditions to help opt op optimize the flow of traffic. And I think as we get more sophisticated, and as Don was describing yesterday, you know, these autonomous cars are not that far away and could have huge transformative effects on the way that we transport ourselves around. And probably one of the most interesting is ownership. And, and would it drastically reduce the need for car ownership? Because if you think about it, if you could, especially for urban residents, if you could at any point summon an summon a autonomous car to come and collect you and drive you where you need to go, what would be the point of owning a car? And would that mean that you know an asset that sits unutilized for 90% of the day for most people, you own a car, but you probably drive it for if you're lucky, maybe an hour a day, you know, the rest of the, the other 23 hours a day, it's sitting in a parking lot or sitting in your driveway or sitting in your garage, right? So you could effectively manufacture far fewer cars and they would be used much more efficiently if they weren't owned exclusively by individuals. So that's kind of the idea that you connect autonomous cars with Uber and all of a sudden you've got uh, a completely transformative. And if the cars were electronic vehicles, then you've really got um, something that could make a difference. Um, in the Netherlands, they have intelligent waste bins. So these intelligent waste bins are activated by smart cards. Um, so they have about 6,000 of these, apparently. And so they track um, individual waste disposal. So you can't actually open the bin without your smart card. And, and then it will measure how much waste you've deposited into the bin and will actually price it according to how much waste you, you <coughs> deposit. And by the way, the recycling bins are free. So there's a real incentive for people to recycle instead of deposit waste, um, especially if you're paying you know, by the pound or whatever the measurement might be or by the kilo. Um, so that's an interesting innovation. Well, that yeah, that's right. <laughs> it, it, it could discourage yeah antisocial behaviors as well, perhaps. Um, the possibility, you know, we've we've heard a lot about interactive marketing and the fact that you can wave your smartphone at a QR code and it will deliver advertising. But it could also potentially deliver you know health promotion messages and other kind of positive um, reinforcement or uh, who knows what. And that's certainly a possibility. And um, and then you get into a, a whole range of interesting environmental sensors. And so I came across this one sensor that um, it will actually measure whether your apple is organic, or not just your apple, but any food. It, it will detect um, uh, contaminants like pesticides and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, so you just dip that little thing into your apple, then it will measure automatically. Um, does it, yeah. I guess Jonathan, you're in New Hampshire. He's, he's developing a technology for reading the freshness of food. Yeah. Um, but the issue is who's going to buy it from the supermarket? Right. I mean, the big retailers really want to have you able to measure the freshness of your food. No. It's a challenge. Yeah, it is a challenge, um, for sure. But, but they're saying, I mean, pretty soon, you should be able to kind of wave your smartphone over produce and, and assess all kinds of um, different variables. Um, we're not quite, well, they may have pilots, but we're not quite there yet. But for sure, what you can do is you can measure air quality. 
um, and there are devices for measuring um, water quality and so forth. The air quality one is interesting because you know air quality data at the moment is taken fairly sporadically at a few locations in any given city. So what they find, of course, is that air pollution can be quite localized, and certain communities within a given city can have much higher concentrations of air pollutants than other regions, especially those that might be located close to highways or close to industrial facilities, for instance. So if everyone's smartphone can measure air quality, then suddenly you could get highly localized readings of what air quality measures are, um, and you could get that uh, on a you know, absolutely real-time, continuous basis and not just periodically. So the kind of granularity and immediacy of the information is much, much higher than it was previously. So that's really interesting. Then, of course, you can plot all that information on maps, which connects to the whole um, mapping stuff we were talking about yesterday. Um, rain sensors and irrigation sensors in farmers' fields. This gets to the connected farmer situation. But again, you know, just in the spirit of conserving resources. So, you know, the one on the left will measure the, you know, the soil moisture and, and the one on the right will measure the, the moisture in the, the actual plants it, itself. So both of these would optimize the use of water, which of course we know is a huge issue with water scarcity. And, and if you can maximize the water usage, you can preserve those resources, but also boost agricultural productivity. And um, in the oceans, uh, they now have robots that are crawling around ocean floors and um, sensor networks that they're deploying uh, off the west coast of Canada. Um, Neptune is, is one of the most advanced um, oceanography programs, I think, on the planet at the moment in terms of its use of in intelligent sensor networks and robotics. I think there's stuff happening in the U.S. as well, but this is certainly one of the leading applications. And so it's way more cost effective than trying to send like a man um, expedition down to the sea floor, which in some cases they can't even get deep enough, but these robots can. So, so that's, that's fascinating. And um, so then the question is, you know, what do, um, how do GSNs leverage all of this um, stuff and all of this immediacy and this real-time data? What's the application of this? So one clearly is that you can make more persuasive arguments with evidence and data. Um, don't just give me an emotional story. Um, Tim talked about that, and I don't disagree with him. Emotional stories connect with people and they mobilize them, but data and evidence is pretty important too, and that's part of what you can do with, with all of this stuff if you can figure out how to make sense of it. Now that's a non-trivial problem, and so you've got organizations like UN Global Pulse, which say, look, we're gonna take a and data different approach to development. And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna work out systems to extract useful information from data. So they recently announced just in advance of the big climate summit in, in September, the big data climate challenge. Um, so what's that all about? Well, the challenge is about trying to build persuasive economic arguments for action on climate change. So let's get past this save the planet um, stuff, which everyone would agree is important, but let's try to make really compelling arguments why action today is feasible and desirable and potentially, um, even for some companies, perhaps profitable. Um, and I think that they have data sets that if they were properly analyzed, might be able to extract some interesting arguments. Um, there is some thinking um, coming out of the same group which suggests that if you monitor information on a more regular basis, and even social media, you can intervene more quickly. Um, and so the example that they have here is about food price inflation. And so they take the example of rice. And so the argument they made is that if you monitor mentions on Twitter and other social media of uh, issues surrounding rice, you actually track very accurately the inflation statistics that are reported by governments. Now the difference is when you monitor it on Twitter, you have that information immediately. When you rely on the official government statistics, you're three months behind, and sometimes more. So three months is a big difference when there's a potential food crisis happening with affordability. Uh, so that, that's a pretty interesting observation. Um, clearly, there's going to be need, you need, you need to be some investment in capability and skills, right? And the ability to 
take data and and deliver it in a way that is compelling and uh, you know that in a way that people can easily understand. So the visualization stuff becomes really important. And some organizations have you know developed really deep competencies around that. I think of the Sunlight Foundation in the United States, for instance. Um, has done a really excellent job of taking government data and putting it into formats people can relate to and interpret and understand. But it, that's not a skill that is widely shared at this point. So I think it's, it's something that we need to invest in in terms of capacity. Uh, probably uh, GSNs as a whole will need to figure out how do we tap into, you know, how do we get data scientists involved in our efforts. And of course, Data scientists are a pretty hot commodity right now. They command a premium dollar, and companies are trying to, you know, they're, they, they can't supply enough of them quickly enough. So it, it might be difficult for a nonprofit entity to attract, you know, top data scientists to work with them. Um, I, I suspect companies like Cisco have a hard enough time just getting those people in the doors. Um, so, you know, there are communities like Kaggle though, right, where you could potentially launch a problem and you've got a community of a, a couple hundred thousand data scientists who are willing to solve challenges. And if you could get, I don't know, uh, the Gates Foundation or the Rockefeller Foundation to help sponsor some of that work, perhaps, you know, you could get communities, you know, participating in, in solving problems um, collectively that require a kind of analytic capability. Um, there's also groups like Random Hacks of Kindness. They've been around for a while um, and they do Good work. I think there's over 5,000 people who are part of this network in 30 different countries. And so they build public interest applications using technology. So that's a kind of community that GSNs could readily exploit because that's what they're there for, is, is to build public interest applications of technology and, and things like big data. Um, for sure, um, just general digital literacy is going to be increasingly important. Um, I think in some of the conversations you know, that we've had with GSN leaders, they just haven't made it a priority to, to get skilled up around technology or to think deeply about how to apply it. Um, and it comes down to resources. Sometimes it's a culture issue. Um, but, but definitely there are, you know, there's a, whole, um, there's a whole MOOC system where people could easily, you know, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Uh, people could get all kinds of um, skills from those kinds of online training systems in terms of you know, just getting more familiar with what technology offers and, and building the skills and there's organizations like Decoded that offer these really intense one-day sessions which can give you the basics of software coding or big data and stuff so there's options that that, um, that groups could exploit and of course I guess the, the final piece is, is simply to try and uh, partner uh, where it makes sense with not just the big tech firms, but with you know startups and small enterprises all over the place that are often looking for ways to deploy their technology in interesting ways and ways that are you know make meaningful contributions. So that's obviously a, 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 an avenue that should be exploited. So that's um, yeah, Phil. Um, Right. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. 
Right. Interesting. Yeah, well, certainly there, there are, um, so that would be an interesting application of, of sort of a, almost a collective intelligence generation system. Uh, and, and, and the other thing that may be related to that, I'm, Don, I'm thinking of um, our, our friend Phil and the prediction markets uh, system that they recently developed, which, again, they came to us and said, you know, we've, we've got this engine for prediction markets which you know, we think could be really influential in your space in terms of predicting the outcome of, of different courses of action. One of the things that we are doing now is working on next generation uh, which um, uh, links people uh, using parameters. So um, the, the, the current problem is um, memory that, that trains human beings to think. So that we're passing information in that we can we're actually doing pop-ups of thoughts that are similar to the ones we've got, but quickly from memory and memory thoughts. So if they train that further, we can get the version of the way to deal with them. Interesting. Mitul. Yeah, just uh, two quick points on that. The, you talked about using data to inform development. Yeah. To sort of inform the conversation around climate change, the UN Global Policy. Those are all great examples. The other piece of it that I think is really interesting is corporations uh, engaging in data for Right. So, sort of, you know, giving pieces of their data to NGOs or governments to sort of, you know, actually solve problems around development. That's something we actually got MasterCard is thinking about. Okay. Like doing data grants. You know, we collect. So I'm at the, the sort of think tank part of MasterCard, but our core business processes, you know, sixty-five thousand transactions a minute every day. And so we have ten different petabytes of data on commercial transactions around the world. Yeah. And so how can we? That's kind of what we're thinking through right now. And I think um, a lot of other corporations, if they're not, they should be thinking about that. We had Twitter up there. Twitter actually also just did their first data grant. Um, but there, there are not a lot of corporations that are thinking about this in this way. That's another really neat trend. And then just to add, um, I think it was Kegel was the. Yep. So there's another organization called Data Kind yep. in New York. And they, they have a volunteer Similar, network yeah. of data scientists from IBM and other places by Cisco. Yeah. Um, that can come in on a project basis and help NGOs figure out how to how to publish data. So right. One of the ventures we're doing. Yeah. Actually, I'm thinking role of business. I mean, so we were you know, one of our projects is you know what what can business do to help solve problems and mm -hmm. and data grants is a great one. And in fact, that reminds me that the example that I, that I'd shown of the Harvard School of Public Health and the mapping of of malaria in Kenya. That was made possible because the mobile providers did a data grant in that case. Because otherwise, those cell phone records wouldn't have been available for that kind of analysis. Um, had to be anonymized, obviously, and as would the credit card transactions. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, good, good. Bob, did you have a, a? Did I see your hand go up? Or uh, no, you were just scratching. Okay. <laughs> did anyone else want to jump in on the? Yeah, yeah Alistair. Just, uh, comments on uh, data science. Is it about? Yeah, uh, I think that. Um, um, the spirit of GSM is always about uh, collaborating and sharing. I have no doubt that people are starting to collaborate, but they don't share. They don't share the data. Yeah, because after the digital revolutions, uh, one of the key changes business grows is that they start to compete on analytics. They go out and they have high profitability, they even foresee. And because of these kind of vested interests, some, I have just emphasized, some players are quite reluctant to share data and let the, uh, the open data be linked up uh, for um, uh, GSMs to use to solve the problems. And now um, the US, the UK, and lots of um, governments around the world spend millions of dollars uh, managing uh, a fortress, fortress and fortress of data. Uh, but uh, it seems to be the, the speed of releasing that kind of data to the public or exchange with private sector or civil society organization are pretty, pretty slow. And um, actually, this, uh, yes, yes, but 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 but, but I, I think things have have changed significantly. I mean, if you go back ten years, I mean, there's there's been a pretty vast improvement there. Now, no doubt, 
you know, we could go further, but even take the World Bank as an example. Victoria and I were having this conversation yesterday morning. I mean, they went through a huge process of, you know, they used to, you know, they're, they, your fortress analogy is exactly right. They defended their data like a fortress. I mean, it was a valuable asset that they sold commercially. But they eventually realized, I think, as a transition in the nature of their organization, that increasingly they're not just a, a bank that lends money. They're a knowledge bank that builds capability and disseminates knowledge about development. And if they're in that business, the value of opening up the data and building the knowledge networks around what they have learned about development and what could be extracted from their data is way more valuable than the revenue streams that they had built you know, by selling their data commercially. Now, there's still factions, I think, within the bank that probably feel disgruntled because they lost revenue streams and business lines and so forth. But the people who advocated for open data ultimately won the argument. So, you know, that train has left the station. And I think in most governments, the, you know, the momentum is in favor of opening up. Now, the, the technical issues in making that possible are not insignificant. So we know it requires, and Simon can back this up, um, substantial investments to liberate that data sometimes. There's no doubt about that. Um, just, yeah. Just a couple points to build on that, but if, if folks aren't aware and are interested in this issue, I'm sure you guys know through the Timber and Green Connection, but the Open Data Institute in the UK is a new organization and also funded by Midyar that's working hard on what, what are the models and the economic business models and the ways we can really push government to open up data. And then there's a number of companies like Socrata and others that are in the business of helping government solve the technical issues. They're not yeah. doing it for free, but they're very, have a very vested interest in it. And there's yeah. a whole group called um, the Data Transparency Coalition in the US that just helped pass the Data Act that's going to open up all the, um, all the uh, uh, funding. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Go Simon, ahead. then Don. I was going to make a quick yeah. follow up on the ODI. I think the ODI is a really interesting organization. It's been on the ODI for a month now. But um, it's really transforming the way that we can meet their goals and society is going to be better and better. What's interesting, I think, is it's not just about the process of opening the data, but they're trying to tackle the government issues as well. So they've created a franchise model. <coughs> Interesting. Both on the international level, but also on the city level. So, putting in place the governance for how do you manage these types of open, open data networks. Mm -hmm. The other thing that, that they're doing is building confidence and visibility. We haven't talked in these talks a lot yet about the challenges of confidence and capability. And you talked a little bit about data scientists, and of course, yeah. we have data scientists out there, but it's much, much broader than that. Yeah. And what they are trying to do is provide an incubator and accelerate the facility for small organizations who are digital entrepreneurs that are developing products and services relating to open data. People like Mass OMC, if you have, if none of you know who Mass OMC is, look them up on the internet, they're doing great work in this space. And providing the tools and capability, the platform technology that you're talking about that will enable the next round of GSM. And one of the things I'd like to talk a little bit about later, hopefully in the discussion, is, is around what, what is the role of government and international institutions in enabling the infrastructure to incubate and accelerate entrepreneurs, digital entrepreneurs that really want to be able to deal with this question? What's the role of the society? And just before we go to you, Robert, I wanted to actually ask you, Victoria, because this is part of what you're working on at, at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is the capacity of, of the overall sector. And I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, what do you think are the solutions? I mean, if, even if they're, you know, tentative, but around this question of capacity building within the sector, around technology in particular. I mean, just one of many capacity issues, probably. But, but what are you seeing is in terms of success cases or strategies? You know, so for capacity building with data collection and management and analysis and things like that, I mean, we've heard some citations. I was thinking earlier about MOOCs that uh, targeted for social science and computer data. I haven't yeah. done that yet. I would expect it any day. 
Um, I think the capacity building piece is huge, but the incentive piece is almost huge. Oh, yeah. It's almost huge. So, so what's explain, the incentive yeah. to collect the data? What's the incentive to share it? What's the incentive to use it? There are huge disincentives in the system, actually, for NGOs to share their data or, frankly, for foundations to. Right? There, there are a lot of disincentives and costs um, to make that happen. So how do you change that? So we're trying to target some of the things that could change the incentive to improve the quality and the demand and therefore necessitate the need for organizations to invest in the capacity. Right. If we go way back right. to change, so one of the things we're looking at is how do you take kind of nonprofit um, philanthropic data, which is right now very isolated and very siloed, and how do you connect to that challenge through the platform? Hmm. But even though the quality is still not very good and the supply is very weak and the demand is kind of spotty, if you start getting it there where it, where people are using it, there's there's an incentive to use it and to, to improve that. And that's just one of the things we're trying to work on. But the capacity is a huge challenge. But you know, it reminds me of the same capacity in the early nineties because nonprofits were using that all the time. Right. So it, it's right. not that different. You know, in that time it was as a foundation to not have a website. I don't know how to use online. We don't, nobody knows how to make a website, a world view is different than a business, and it's the same thing for NGOs and nonprofits. And now, <coughs> most nonprofits have a website. They're online, they have computers in the office. So I think the industry, the sector's always behind, and that's a shame because we're trying to tackle other problems. So, how do you accelerate the, the industry, so to speak, to be um, where it needs to be? And a lot of that is through partnerships. It is through partnerships with companies, and it is through companies donating their data and doing global polls, being an intermediary, and right. then others can do that analysis and that platform development and the data that has to be um, performance. Right. So, Thank sorry, you. That yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> no, that, that, that was Robert. Robert you know. Yeah. Yeah. The capacity building, there's a, um, uh, I was at the launch and involved in um, something called the Web Science Institute which is um, the history, again, it's related to the ODI and open data in academia. Uh, Southampton, supported by Cambridge and Oxford, it's a multidisciplinary look at web science. So it's sociologists and computer science and law, um, and um, that involves Tim Berners-Lee, it involves a guy called Sir Nigel Shadfold, Dane and the board are there, um, in sort of representing different disciplines. Um, and, you know, at the heart of that is um, looking at data sciences, but also just looking at you know very very broad um, issues. But it, it's coming at the problem from a academic, you know, capacity building perspective, um, and, and there's a lot of support. I think it's quite an important thing to you know, see some of the facts here and some of the other. Right, Don. Did you want to jump in? <clears throat> I just wanted to float a couple of ideas. Oh, I have a microphone. How yeah. cool is that? Um, <clears throat> uh, first of all, um, we talked about electronic uh, payments, money, and so on. Um, but there's the whole, it's not even the same category, it's uh, digital currencies. And uh, we've been kind of musing about this for a while, wondering um, how it fits into our story, if at all. And we've become convinced, uh, A, that it fits in big time, and B, that that these uh, digital currencies are probably the real deal, that they address a whole bunch of real problems in the world, like no bank is going to give an account to somebody who's got $20, because it's just a big money losing proposition. And so there's an opportunity to, uh, around financial inclusion, to bring a majority of the world's population into the uh, uh, economy. There are all kind of, kinds of other opportunities that we're exploring. And there are all kinds of um, terrifying kind of uh, dangers and challenges. So um, I've been saying for some time, when you see an opportunity and there are a whole bunch of problems, you have to put them in one of two categories. Is this, does this go in the pot called, this is a bad idea and we shouldn't do it? Or does it go in the pot of implementation challenges? And right now we're sort of, Leaning that all of this goes and all of these problems go in the pot of implementation challenges and what may in fact be need for digital currencies, Bitcoin and so on, is a governance network that kind of looks like the network that governs the ecosystem uh, of the internet. 
And uh, depending on who you talk to, this is a really big deal. Now, if you talk to Mark Andreessen, he says this is as big as the internet because the internet's this really great platform for posting pictures of your cat and collaborating and doing uh, other stuff like that. He doesn't really, he's not pejorative about it. After all, he did create the first web browser. But he says what we need is a similar platform for commerce where you can really know if someone's been paid, where you can't pay someone twice, where you can syndicate trust across the, uh, the global economy, where you can basically eliminate fraud. And there's all kinds of, in the Bitcoin algorithm, there's, there are techniques that in theory would enable such incredible benefits to occur. So uh, this is just, a, I'm sure we're going to get you engaged in that whole conversation. And because there's some issues like, oh, would the banks be disintermediated if you did this? Um, right now we pay all these transaction fees for banks who are in the middle and they, between, you know, money and consumers or between capital markets and companies or, 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 or whatever. What if that all became digital? What would happen? Um, so uh, just if any of you are interested in this, we're kind of up to here in it right now. Uh, the second, I just wanted to float a, a big idea. Um, in the, yesterday I talked about open government. And uh, I said that it's a blindfolded person, the elephant. It's not about transparency only, although sunlight is a great disinfectant. It's not about citizen engagement or the boundaries of governments becoming more porous and governments rather than pushing stuff out to citizens, co-creating and co-innovating with them. It's also about open data. And the governments, by releasing raw data, can create a platform upon which um, the other sectors of society can self-organize to create public value, okay? It's not about outsourcing because there's nothing in in the first place. It's about a new division of labor in society, about how we create what we used to call government. So what if, here's the idea, what if we created a city as a platform rather than just a government or a country? What if we, say, had leadership in the city of Toronto and we didn't have a mayor who, no, sorry, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> what if we created an open city whereby it wasn't just government releasing raw data, it was the transportation system and the electrical power grid and the shopping malls and the hospitals and the laboratories and the banks and the every institution within a city. What if somehow we could start to build a movement to open up a city? Wouldn't that unleash an historic wave of value creation, of entrepreneurship, of innovation. Imagine what scientists could do with, it, with this kind of data. Imagine how we could redesign our public transit systems if we had data about what's happening with cars and subways and traffic and, and all the rest. Now, does that go in the bucket of a really bad idea or does that go in the bucket of this is something with a lot of implementation challenges? It's already happening. I mean, we're, we're involved in and you know what? That's a great transition to your panel. So come on up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot.